Well, good morning, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started uh, as people continue to file into the room today. Um, so welcome, my name is Deandra Coleman. I'm with the Virginia SBDC Network. For those of you that are not familiar with our organization, the Virginia SBDC is a partnership program between the US Small Business Administration, George Mason University and local host institutions throughout Virginia. With 27 locations across the Commonwealth, we provide training and technical assistance to small businesses at their local communities. Our one-on-one -on -one consulting services are available at no charge. Today's webinar, Future of Customers and Consumer Behavior, is presented by the Alexandria SBDC and hosted by the Virginia SBDC Network. We are recording today's presentation and it will be posted on our website. Due to the large number of participants, everyone's microphone is muted, but if you have questions, you can type those into the Q&A box. If we're unable to get to your question, you can email us after the webinar and ask your question there. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's session. Amy is the principal at Mole Consulting and has been working with the Alexandria SBDC for more than five years. She is an experienced program designer, facilitator, and writer, and has been working with the Alexandria SBDC on this series. Please join me in welcoming Amy Shields. Thanks so much, Deandra. I really appreciate it. So welcome everyone this morning. We're thrilled to have you with us in the first of this series. And um, uh, like Deandra said, we're going to be talking about uh, customers and consumer behavior today. Um, but we thought that there's been so much discussion about economic recovery, about what's next for a business, but some of that discussion doesn't always touch directly on what's next for small business. So we've put together this series and this first session to really take some of that a high level macro conversation and to really think about what that means for small businesses um, and especially small businesses in Virginia. So thanks again for joining us today. I'd like to start by introducing our speakers. Uh, so we are thrilled to be joined by two fantastic speakers today. Uh, first up, we'll be hearing from Gotham. Gotham uh, Vadak Kapat is an award-winning researcher, educator, and founding director of George Mason University's Center for Retail Transformation. His research focuses on issues in the domains of social media, technology, innovation, and non-product market strategies, things like sustainability, government, business relationships, corporate activism, with a specific interest in the retail sector. Prior to starting his academic career, Gotham worked for General Electric as a quality engineer and an e-business analyst. Victoria Vargason, our second speaker, is the owner of the Hour Shop and the Modern Home Bar and is the author of Capital Cocktails, Old Town Drinks, and Home Bar Basics, Cocktails at Home Anytime. Victoria created The Hour, a store celebrating the art of the cocktail, almost 12 years ago. She has a partnership with Neiman Marcus and has several boutiques in stores throughout the country. Today, she has converted her brick and mortar store in Old Town Alexandria into a showroom and is focusing her efforts on expanding her website and social media presence. Uh, so uh, we're gonna hear from Gotham and then Victoria, and then we will open up for some time for Q&A. And then um, we will uh, also be taking a little bit of time to reflect on some of the trends that um, Gotham and Victoria will be discussing today um, and give you a chance to figure out what that means for your own business. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Gotham. Thank you, Amy. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, today, this morning, to discuss uh, the impact of consumers and the future of consumers. Um, and hopefully you can all hear me well. Uh, I'll, I'll get started. Just before I get started, I want to kind of talk to you briefly about what the Center for Retail Transformation is. And it, it is a center that is focused on small and medium-sized retailers and trying to help them manage the transition to quote unquote, the new retail, which is a digital enabled technology driven uh, retail. Uh, and that kind of sets a nice context for what I'm going to talk about today, which is the changing customer expectations uh, and how COVID has played an accelerating role in this demand. So I, I am no Nostradamus and predicting the future is always a difficult task. Uh, what I'm going to do today is to talk to you 
about the trends that I see both as the director of the center as well as through research where I've talked with over 150 small and medium-sized businesses and we've done surveys across Gen Z, the millennials and so forth to understand where things are heading. I'm gonna talk about five trends that I see, some of which are very, very common and some perhaps not as common. So to kick things off, um, I'll, I'll talk about the first trend, which is which should come as no surprise, which is that digital is the new normal, right? We, uh, we just heard, we're gonna hear a little bit of, uh, in the next part by the next speaker about how they're moving to a digital context. And we see that COVID has played a major role in accelerating the adoption of digital, right? So where people used to spend about 12 hours a day on looking at the screen, mostly for work and for entertainment. Nowadays, this is a vision direct uh, survey where they spend 19 hours looking at the screen. And a lot of it is now not just about work or entertainment, but it's about connecting with others, right? With COVID, I don't know how many of you have done it, but we do this quite often, almost on a daily basis now, where we get on FaceTime or on Zoom and we call our friends and family and try to connect with them. And we have cocktails uh, virtually uh, almost every day at about seven o'clock. It's a, a little late for cocktail, but that's when we have our cocktails. Uh, and in, importantly, what you see is that there is an ease of adoption of digital, right? So my, my parents used to uh, refuse to be on any kind of digital platform, but today they are far more accessible to us via the digital platforms. And this digital fluency is just going to increase. Now, while it might be expected that as soon as COVID goes away and we are all vaccinated, we're gonna come back to a, a brick and mortar setting. I think my own perspective is that this is here to say, stay. I, I work with a large retailer and what we have seen is that uh, the older population have now gotten way more comfortable with digital shopping and they seem not to want to come back to a physical setting. All this being said, e-commerce is only 14% of all sales at this point of time. And it has, it has grown by about 3% over COVID, not the expected 33% that everyone was talking about. Right? So there is still a very big place in our economy for physical uh, retail, brick and mortar retail. And that brings me to the next point which is that how do uh, retail and in general small businesses succeed? It's about raising the customer experience bar. Right? And, and this probably is again, another thing that is very common and people kind of expect this kind of a behavior. Um, we conducted a survey where we found out uh, that, I found out that about 30% of people actually use convenience as the main deciding factor. But what is convenience today is very different from what, what was convenience just six months ago or a year ago, right? With all of these things, buy online, pick up in store, the notion of convenience has been completely flipped on its head and there's going to be increasing competition on this space. So as a small business owner, one has to think about how, what is convenience for your customer and how can you compete on the space uh, how can we actually offer something that is more of value? The second part that we have seen, and I'm sure, I mean, we're all on a Zoom seminar now, is this idea of wanting to be entertained. Uh, it has accelerated the use of digital tools, has accelerated the desire for a shopping experience or for any kind of experience to be not just about a transaction or a relationship, but it's about entertainment. And we see social commerce being one of the key drivers. Now it's expected to go to about $40 billion. Uh, and and that's, that's the future. That's where people are going. And so we need to use these digital tools more effectively to entertain uh, the individuals as well, not just providing a product or a, or a service, but one has to think about the entertainment aspect very, very important. Uh, we have uh, over 150 small businesses and consumers that we've spoken to, where we found that it, from a consumer perspective, no one cares how you're delivering the experience. 
what they care about is how well you integrate the experience, uh, how seamless it is, how blended it is. And, and the, the lines between physical and digital is blurring extremely fast. And I think that's a trend that you're going to see uh, grow astronom astronomically, right? I think uh, what we found is that almost in the, with the small businesses that I've been connected with, about 60% of them actually added a channel to communicate with the consumer that was a digital channel. Most commonly was WhatsApp or some kind of FaceTime approach. And this is going to increase uh, as we continue. Uh, we're also seeing the need for people to be connected, right? This comes as no surprise to most people listening in is that we've lived in our own bubbles. We've seen the growth of human bubbles where we have smaller groups connecting with each other. Uh, but as we get past the stage, the desire to be connected with each other, the desire to learn is going to grow more. Uh, last but not the least is that we spend most of our time at home, the work from home phenomena is here to stay. What this means is that there's going to be a desire for flexibility, a desire for the ability to deliver on demand. Uh, and that's going to change the way companies do business uh, and the, the opportunities that is available for them. One of the things that I found through a lot of the interactions is that in the past six months, we've seen COVID provide consumers with a license to switch brands. And this is a concerning part as well as an opportunity for small businesses. About 60% of our 200 odd respondents in a survey said that they have actually tried a new brand. Uh, and that they are more willing to try new brands. Now, about 44% said that. What this means is that consume, companies have to actually try to make sure that the customer experience is unique every time, or they are a threat of losing their customers. So the bar is being raised and increasingly uh, the expectations are being raised. Um, Amy, if you don't mind, to the next slide. Okay. So the third thing that, that ties to this experience aspect is the fact that health has now become wealth. And what do I mean by that? We have lived in a, for a, over a year where we are concerned about what we touch, how we interact with the physical environment, who we come in contact with, and how we come in contact with. Uh, what we found again on a, in our survey was that about 40% of consumers said that, look, I might not come to a physical store in, uh, in the near future because I'm concerned about safety reasons. So this means that as a, as a small business owner, you're having to put safety first, perhaps something that was not top of mind initially. You also see one of the other things that we found in our survey was this idea of uh, burnout. And that comes from the work-life balance. As we work from our homes, our homes have now become offices and we spend more time. I actually get on calls at eight o'clock at night and it's really bad, shouldn't do that, won't recommend anyone to do that. But that blurring of the work-life has resulted in many uh, burnouts and the focus now is that how do we return? How do we gain our boundaries? How do we set up the boundaries? How do we prevent this burnout? We have a time poverty that most people are dealing with. And how can we actually try to help with regards to maintaining the boundaries, alleviating this time poverty issue? What we also noticed was the desire for companies to be more empathetic. Um, one, of the, one of the studies that I've been conducting is talking to small and large companies, trying to figure out how they deal with their employees. And the word that kept, kept coming back over and over again was this word empathy, is that leadership now is about empathy showing to their employees and to the consumers that they understand what they're dealing with and what 
are the challenges that they face. I think that this is here to stay. The expectation from consumers that you deal with them from in an empathetic and kind manner is here to stay. The last thing with regards to health is the desire to maintain our health with the fact that there's burnout and stuff like that. There is an increasing desire for people to connect with their uh, with the environment to stay healthy. You've seen the rise of uh, in-house or in-home fitness. And I think that's here uh, to stay. Whether it is the most effective way to be fit, I question it. I myself would love to go back to the gym to uh, get my fitness in. But you see that this is here. Again, people have reprioritized what is important to them. And health has become one of the primary aspects. And so for companies who are trying to serve consumers, trying to connect with these aspects, which were perhaps initially not elements that they focused on, is important moving forward. Um, next slide. There's again a, a, a sense of changing priorities that you, companies are dealing with uh, from their customers, the expectation of transparency, which basically just means, hey, who are you buying from? What kind of labor conditions are there? Being transparent, treating them as partners is, uh, is increasingly important. It comes up all the time, especially from the Gen Zers, uh, the young generation, the college students. And I do this, uh, I ask my students this question every semester. Uh, and you know they, they are willing to vote with their wallets with regards to activities that uh, one does not necessarily tie to actually purchase behavior, right? Uh, things with regards to social change, things with regards to sustainability are very, very important things for them in identifying which brands they will support. And more and more that is, it used to be four or five years ago when I started doing this in my classes, it used to be like way down on, the, on, a, on a 10 item scale, it used to be about eight. But now in, in the past one semester, it has actually risen up to being in the top four factors that is causing a, a consumer to select a brand. That's a change that I think was going to stay for better or for worse, it's going to stay as is the need for being part of a community. Companies that are able to enhance a community perspective and build a community amongst their customers, I think are going to emerge winners in the long term. And that's a, a change in mindset that companies have to deal with and again, the digital tools play an enabling role to do that. The last point I want to touch upon is this notion that, again, stating the obvious, that value matters, right? We have gone through an extremely shocking period in our lifetimes where a lot of households have lost employment. People have had to think about what to cut from their purchase behavior. People, neighbors of mine, uh, have had to go through extenuating circumstances uh, in our own household also. We've had stories uh, of the like. And this has cost many people in my own network, and this is more from a personal thing, not as much from a survey or from talking to companies or customers, that people have started defining, redefining what value means. Even luxury brands, the people can, people have started saying, okay, what do I need? What is really, what does premium mean? And they, many of them are taking a step down. But at the same time, we've seen that savings rate has is the highest that it has ever been. So what I think we'll see is a separation that's been talked about quite often, is the K-shaped uh, separation where you're going to see one group that's going to spend a lot and perhaps have more money in the bank to do this. But then there is another group that is going to be even more frugal, even more thrifty, even more questioning of what products to buy and what value the product brings to their lifestyle. So as a company, this requires you to be even more in touch with who your customers are, what the situation is currently, and how it is moving forward and try to adapt to those needs. You know, as an example, thrifting has now become one, uh, one of the staple things 
You see a lot of companies going public who are basically in the resale business, and that's here to stay, right? This was not before. People used to have second thoughts about buying reused products, but not anymore. More and more people are buying it, and we'll see that even big companies have gotten into the business, and that's a trend that's here to stay. So value is being redefined and has been redefined during the past one year. Uh, and we'll see the redefinition continue to happen as we go out. And so there is increasing expectation from customers on superior experience, being more technology enabled, being more connected, not just with the company, but with other customers and their peers learning, all of which is going to put additional pressure on the companies to deliver not just on the product and the quality of the product, but on all these peripheral aspects as well of the experience. And that's it. That's my, uh, my five big trends and I uh, look forward to any questions. Great, thank you so much, Gotham. Um, so now we're gonna transition over. Um, we do have Gotham's email address here. So you have that in, um, in the slides that were sent to you. Um, so we're going to transition over to Victoria, and part of the reason that we asked Victoria to speak this morning was because she has actually been ahead of several of the trends that Gotham mentioned and has been um, incorporating those into her business model since before the pandemic. So we thought she would be um, a great person to speak to how she's seen the evolution of some of these consumer behaviors over the course of um, her work. So with that, I will go ahead and um, turn it to Victoria. Um, I will say, if you have questions, please feel free to go ahead and put those into the Q&A box. Uh, we will open for questions after Victoria has finished her portion of the presentation, but please feel free to go ahead and drop those in um, if you'd like to. So, Victoria? Thanks, Amy and Gotham. Uh, Gotham, so many of the points you raised, I totally embrace and totally believe what you said. Um, I own a retail boutique store here in Old Town. And while we've been here for 12 years, this last year, for most of you who have been uh, experiencing uh, retail, has been had plenty of challenges and plenty of uh, ability to adapt and pivot, as the big word is this year. Um, and what I did, we when last March hit, you know, we we had to shut down, and I had basically um, been trying to build my website over the last couple of years and probably had about maybe 30 or 40 percent of my items online. Uh, when I realized that my brick and mortar store would no longer be open or at least would be closed for a significant portion of time in the, that was coming up when it, when it first closed, I decided it was time to really go all in and um, really try and beef up my sales through online, uh, my online website. And I'm here to say that uh, I think that that is the way of the future. Um, it's my understanding that both millennials and uh, baby boomers are a lot of the, I uh, hold a lot of the wealth in this country right now. And if you're looking to sell, you have to figure out who your customer base is and how you are going to reach them. Um, this past year had all of us uh, kind of figuring out how to work at home and how to buy online uh, and it was up to us who are selling to the public um, how to figure out how to meet their expectations. Uh, so a lot of this was um, kind of growing and uh, figuring out uh, how to do how to the hard distribution, how we were going to get products to our customers, whether it be through uh, curbside pickups or deliveries or shipping. Um, those those that customer experience we realized is, is as important as reaching our customers. So what I'm going to show with you, because I'm the case study for the morning, uh, is basically my analytics from last year to see how important the online sales have become for me uh, and why I converted my brick and mortar store really into a showroom that specializes now in online sales. Um, so any of you go, the, the first slide will be my analytics from last year, just to show you how, how I saw my, why I'm selling online. Uh, if you look at my overall number of visitors to my website last year, it was an astounding 166, almost 166,000 visitors visited my website last year. I was shocked by these numbers. Uh, my online sales and my online presence increased by over 196%. 
Uh, and it was without, it was basically a lot of the effort on my part, but a lot of it was building on my um, current website, which as you can see, my direct, uh, my direct visitors were about 30,000 of that. So some people knew who the owl was, but what I'm here to say is it's important if you're gonna sell online to make sure that you're building a website that uh, is basically uh, set up for your customers to be able to easily access and understand and purchase and for search engines to be able to find you. So SEO work um, is important as well. Um, and then of course, integrating all of your website with uh, social media, and that can include Insta Instagram, Facebook, and Pinterest. Um, and one of the statistics you'll see from here is how high up on the level Pinterest is. My Pinterest, in fact, uh, outranks my Instagram and Facebook combined. Uh, and I'll talk about that more later. Um, but 166,000 people, I don't get that many people coming through my brick and mortar store. So that shows you the power of the internet and the power of the potential of new customers that could be coming to your business if you sold online or if you had an online presence. Um, as I said, it's important for the customer to be, go ahead, go to the next one. It's important for the customer to be able to um, easily identify once they hit your website. So one of the things that SEO work, which I am not an expert in any of this, I recommend um, hiring people, outsourcing as much as you can, know what you're good at, and know, know who your customer base is. I apologize, I'm in the city, so you're gonna hear some background noise today. Um, but one of the SEO tricks, I'm gonna teach you tricks and tips here, is to basically use repetitive words all the time that basically focuses on who you are and what you sell and what you do. So for me, it's vintage designer, barware, glassware. I use that all the time. I basically, um, it, whether it's in my menu, whether it's in my descriptions, whether it's in my drop down bars, I have it so the customers, when they first see my page, they immediately know who I am and what I do and what I sell. It's important, remember who you're selling to. You know, If you're selling to that baby boomer and they're kind of new to really buying online or kind of getting used to it, you wanna be able to hit them immediately. Good photography matters. And I think it's wonderful now with all of the um, smartphones out there, the amount of photography we can get on our own. We don't need, I originally, when I set up my website had hired a professional photographer. I don't do that anymore. I do it all on my own. Um, so you'll see the, that, you know, throughout, you can, you can really get nice pictures and videos by yourself and it, it really pays off. Um, you can organize your drop down menu with more details. You want to give customers uh, various ways of shopping online, whether it is through the drop down menus, through the shop collections, through buttons on your page. Um, and you also want to, as, as Gotham said, you want to be totally clear about who you are. Allow your customers to contact you, allow them to know who you are, why you do what you do, what your background is, um, what your store hours are, how you're going to get their products to them. All of that matters. Uh, and that first initial glimpse of your website is really the key. Uh, next page. So as you scroll further down, you again can get more into who you are. You can, again, photography, most of these pictures I took myself, uh, a tip to the trade, there's a company called photoshopit.com. You can send them individual product shots and they will send them back to you for about a dollar a piece and this nice little white background. You don't have to hire somebody um, to do it. It's, there, there are tricks out, tricks out there to help you get your website going. I use Shopify because I, it's, it's totally integrated with my social platforms. It's easy to use. I hired a Shopify expert to help me set up my um, Shopify website. Uh, all, the, all the tools are there for you to use. There are other platforms out there as well that do this, but Shopify I found worked really well for me. Again, as people are scrolling down my, my first uh, initial page, they can see there's other ways of shopping. They can see the kinds of things I carry. And then there's much more detailed information about me at the bottom. Okay, next page, but content matters. The other thing I was gonna say is make sure you, you basically, uh, every product you, you, you write a description, every page you write a description. And because the more, the more content you put out there, the more Google and Yahoo and the other search platforms really get to know what you do and who you are. And you wanna basically land on that first page when people are Googling what you sell or what you do. And the best way to do that is put content out on the website. Um, so how to market your website, uh, Instagram and Facebook now have the ability to sell products directly through their platforms. 
uh, that link to your website. So somebody can see something on Instagram, click on a link, it takes them straight to your website, they can purchase. It's a great tool and everybody should be using this because it really does uh, produce sales. You can also buy ads that focus on your audience if you, you know, help you to develop and define your audience. And these platforms as well um, give you insights and analytics into who is purchasing from you. So that's, it's important to um, be able to get feedback and they're really, they're great platforms to use. They don't require a lot of effort. Uh, again, these are all photos I took. Um, and then the other thing is Instagram. You can work with others. One of the things that I found to help me boast my exposure is to collaborate. I collaborate with restaurants. I, I, um, I not only talk about what I sell, but I talk about others that are related to what I sell. And it kind of gets me exposure in the community. And I think that that's something that everybody should try to do. Uh, the power of the video is that, as I said, we all have uh, great smartphones. And for under a minute, you can pick up a product, show how you use it, talk about it, tell, tell why you like it. And it gets tons of views. And those views, as you can see, I, I was showing a uh, how to use a, a vintage uh, mixing glass here. It got over a thousand views and it took me less than a minute to do. Um, and every time there's another view, that's more eyes who get to see your products and more people who become aware of what you sell. Next page. But my key and my secret sauce and ingredient that I strongly believe in uh, is Pinterest. And I don't think it gets the exposure that a lot of folks um, know about. People who go to Pinterest, uh, those consumers are looking to buy. They are looking for an experience they're looking to DIY. They're, they're just looking for things that they that, that interest them. And so it's what Gotham was talking about is trying to connect to com your community, figure out what they like. Pinterest boards are another platform for search engines. They're separate from, from Google. They are separate from um, Yahoo. They are in and of themselves their own search engine. And it's all very visual. So if you have, if you have, if you have products, um, you, you can have it's basically mood boards. You basically set up a one mood board that maybe shows your products, but then you set up a bunch of other mood boards that show things that are related to what you do. So for me, it's it could be uh, entertaining. It could be hors d'oeuvres. It could be Mad Men parties. It could be um, setting up a home bar. And it doesn't have to be necessarily my product. But what happens is every time you pin something or pin something that somebody else has pinned, you repin, as they say, it gets you exposure. So for me, while well, I got uh, last year close to 166,000 on uh, views through Google and through other search engines, on Pinterest alone, if you look at it, I am getting over 170,000 people a month, a month seeing me. Um, and it's just, it's just from pinning. And the numbers of people, the exposure that you get, and the people that are coming to my shop directly from Pinterest, you can also buy off of Pinterest because your, your products are tagged there. And they, again, they go straight to the website. Uh, it is a fabulous tool that everybody should be using. Uh, and it doesn't get a lot of exposure. Um, basically, you want to show things that inspire you. Uh, you want to basically use your own products as well. And there are platforms like Tailwind, which is one of the ones that I use that you can sit down in the beginning of the week and for less than an hour, schedule all these pins, create pins, do what you want and forget about it. And they will post for you. They will link to your website. They will do all the work for you. Um, my, my goal is to try and pin 10 times a day. And if I'm doing it on a daily basis, it takes me less than 10 minutes. It's, it doesn't require a lot of time, but it gets you a whole heck of a lot of exposure. So if we go to the next page, I'll show you real quickly. These are the kinds of boards that I have. So for me, it can be everything from cocktail recipes to rocks glasses to bitters to Mad Men parties to uh, hors d'oeuvres, as I said. And then within the boards that I created, every day I go to my home feed and it gives me, Pinterest gives me other people who have pinned things that, that they think I might be interested in. So I repin those to these boards. Uh, and then people might come across my board and say, hey, I like that cocktail shaker. And they pin it to their board because they're going to be having a cocktail party in a month and then they go to their board a month later and they're getting ready to put their cocktail party together and they're like hey you know i need a cocktail shaker oh i forgot about the hour oh let me go check the website so it gives you legs and people repin and repin and the more that people pin it just it broadens your reach and it broadens your exposure and it's one that i highly recommend we can go to the last last board that i have and it shows you specifically here was one that i did on um, bar carts 
And as you can see, uh, I have everything from bar carts from Williams Sonoma to a couple of my own um, and others that I just saw that were pretty pictures that I thought, oh, that make a nice bar cart at home. So I'm, I'm kind of advertising my competitors, but in reality, those competitors also see me and they might pin mine and then the, their, their clientele might see me on their boards. So it's kind of a, it's, it's a, it's nothing more than another search engine that is very visual. Um, you can also create stories and you can do videos on Pinterest as well. Um, but anyway, that's one of my tricks that I think everybody should know. So uh, get online if you're not, that's, that's my pitch. Great, thank you so much, Victoria. Um, appreciate you being willing to share your insights and a little bit of what's behind your strategy. Uh, so now we're gonna go ahead and move into our Q&A portion here. So keep dropping those questions into the Q&A box. I'm gonna go ahead and pause the screen share um, and so that we can see our uh, speakers a little bit better as we go ahead and um, move to our Q&A. Uh, so I would uh, like to start, Victoria, there's a couple of questions that came from your, uh, from the information that you were sharing. And um, we have a question here where you had referenced that um, you try to pin things 10 times a day. It usually takes you no more than 10 minutes. Um, how long did it take you to get to that point where you were able to do that quickly? Um, and how much prep is involved for you to be able to, uh, to be able to do that? Uh, it doesn't take hardly any time at all. You basically develop your Pinterest page. And from that page, Pinterest will ask you what you're interested. And you might say, like for me, I'm interested in cocktail recipes. I think about what my customers might want to be asking me, like if they came into my store. Uh, how do you set up a home bar? What are your favorite gin, gin recipes? Uh, do you, what do you, if you're going to throw a mad night party, what would it be? And I create boards. And then what Pinterest does, because they have all of these algorithms, they find out what I'm interested in and they send me every day. It's called your home feed. They send you other people's pins that are related to those topics that you've told them you're interested in. So you get your home feed is there. And from that home feed, you basically all of a sudden you start seeing recipes. You're like, hey, I like that recipe. I'm going to pin that one to my board. I like that idea for a Mad Men party. I'm going to pin that to that Mad Men board. And you basically, all you, it, it literally is just, you get these ideas and you do 10 pins and it's, it takes seconds. It really, it's, it is one of the easiest, it's, I find it so much easier than Instagram or Facebook. Um, it requires just repinning. You can add a comment if you want. You can also create your own pins. So sometimes I might have a cocktail set that I would think would be a great for a, for a wedding, you know, reception or rehearsal dinner. And it might be a punch bowl. So I might create my own pin. And then that gets exposure to it. And you can even place advertisements for a couple cents a day and they, they get you exposure. It's so easy to use. You just have to try it. And you can't, you can't go wrong. You just have to pick your topics and just go for it. Great, thanks. Um, I have a couple other questions for you, Victoria. Um, so one question is about your conversion rate. Um, what does that look like when you think about the flow from you know, Pinterest or Instagram or Facebook views to your website views and how that translates into sales? Um, what insights do you have about that? My conversion rate varies on the various um, platforms that I'm using. Um, obviously, given my numbers that you saw, people who just search for me on Google I make, uh, my average sale is about $300 a sale. So my conversion rate, and you can do the math, I mean, I, 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 it varies from, you know, maybe, I haven't really looked at my numbers lately, but they're, um, they're significant. I mean, I was able to more than break even last year just based on my online sales from my prior year. I mean, it, 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 does, it does convert. Um, and again, the biggest areas are Google, people that know you, um, uh, knowing your customer base. I mean, this may not be for everybody. If you're selling ice cream and you're really dependent on local people and not the internet, you know, this may not be the platform for you. But if you're looking to broaden your reach and your exposure and the numbers of potential customers, uh, there's such great potential here. Great, and that um, transitions us to some of our other questions. And Gotham, I'm gonna refer uh, these questions to you. So we have a couple of folks that are asking, um, how would some of this translate to um, someone who's maybe selling a service instead of a product or goods? What are some of the um, trends that you've noticed that would translate into 
um, more of a service sector or um, how, how would you think about some of these trends or using some of the tactics that Victoria mentioned um, as we start to think about service-based businesses? Uh, so, so I think that, let me talk about the two things that Victoria talked about, what, right? One is the use of digital. And I think there is a huge opportunity to actually use digital to provide a superior customer experience. Uh, so I myself in the context of gyms, uh, right? We have fitness people and we interact over the digital media uh, more so and you connect with them more often. So that's an, that's an easy way to kind of uh, think about the service part as to how do we actually get the customer intimacy. Uh, and the second aspect uh, with regards to this whole thing is that uh, who are your customers, right? You're able to, what Victoria was kind of trying to get at was two things. One is that you, are, you, are new, you can actually acquire a lot of new customers. And in the context of the service experience, uh, it's actually even broader. Right, so you're able to use these different channels of communication to get a larger access to your audience and a more frequent access. If you if you will, like Victoria's shop is actually open 24 uh, seven <laughs> online, and I think that's the 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 essence is to look at look at it as ways to enhance customer int intimacy. Great, thank you. Um, so I think my next question is. For both of you, um, how do you, you know, Victoria, you showed all of your analytics from your website and your traffic. What are some other ways that you are getting feedback from customers or sort of keeping your finger on the pulse of those trends? Um, what are some other tools that business owners might use? Are there, you know, surveys or anything like that that you've been using? And Gotham, if you have any recommendations of places that folks can go to stay current with some of these changing trends. Okay. Well, I would say, first of all, small business, you're, the organization in Virginia, and especially in Alexandria, we have a great small business uh, unit here, and they have so much data and so much um, information and provide so much help to, and have to me in the past, uh, and still do. Um, they're a great source for reaching out. Also, getting to know your local community. I mean, I, we have a small bevy of great entrepreneurs here in town, and I'm associated with a lot of the, the female owners. And we get together and we share stories. I mean, talk to people in your community. Um, you know, we're all in the same boat together and we're all, the more that we help each other, the more we help ourselves. So part of it is just really getting out there and, and, and getting to know your, your local community as well as your customer base. Um, and then also it's, it is truly the customer service. It is, if they call you, you respond immediately. If they send you a note, you respond. If they write you an email, you, you, are, you are there to help them. Uh, if they want to come in at odd hours, you try and make things work that, you know, that basically helps. And you get feedback from your community, too. So. I, I can't I can't uh, trump what she just said. I, I think that's a secret to doing it is to actually connect with your community, connect with your customers. It's as simple as putting a form out there on your website saying, do you have any feedback for me? Uh, right. And, and that's the easiest way. And I think. One important thing, and I, Victoria, I'm curious to see when you went online and you moved online, I'm assuming that your reach actually expanded dramatically from just a local area to a larger audience. Oh, significantly. This past year, it, it exploded. Um, yeah, my, my numbers, as I said, they, my sales went up 196%, but my, my reach was probably beyond that. And, and that's the thing is that my with regards to how do you stay in, in touch is to think a little bit more global, right? Like what has happened from the COVID era is that you might be local, but you're actually having a global impact. Like what Victoria is having, possibly some of your customers on Pinterest are actually coming from a global footprint. Uh, and so accessing sources outside of your community is just as important to figuring out what the trends are. And that's the one thing I try to press upon is to look outside of your comfort zone to see what's the new trends, right? And in the context of retail, some of the really cool trends are actually happening outside of the US with regards to China, with regards to Asia, where social commerce is like art and way advanced towards over here. So to stay abreast of the trends, you have to have a little bit more of a global mindset and then uh, I'll, I'll make a pitch for the academic institutions uh, here is that 
you know, the future generations are at the institutions nearby. Connect with them, understand, you'll, you'll be able to get them to help you with your projects if you have any, many of you will have that need, right? You'll also be able to understand what's the future when you talk to them. So that's an easy way to actually get some feedback on where the trends are going before you get there. And I'm sure, Victoria, you might have actually connected with some, maybe not the Mason students, but other students to kind yeah. of... Get <laughs> There you go. So, so that's one easy way to actually do it, with, which also helps you build community, gets you access to customers before they even thought about being your customer. Uh, and so that's the one last recommendation. Great. We also have a, a recommendation that came through uh, the Q&A for Fast Company Magazine as maybe another suggestion of a way to keep up with some more global trends worldwide. So thanks for that suggestion as well. Um, I, Victoria, I'm going to circle back with you on some of the content development pieces that you do. Um, and we have a couple of questions related to that. Um, you had mentioned that you're using a content calendar to schedule some of your things ahead of time. Can you talk a little bit about the balance of scheduling ahead of time versus sort of in real time? How do you approach that? Well, one of the wonderful things about these plat scheduling platforms, uh, I use Tailwind. I've also used Later, which is another one that's very good. Um, and they allow you, again, you know, we're all living in this virtual world right now and our schedules kind of very, are very flexible. Um, and it's nice to be able to sit down when you have time and do a bunch of scheduling because you don't know what tomorrow or three days from now is going to bring. And then you don't have to worry about it. So when I can, I do use those platforms uh, and you can schedule and you can also tell when you can schedule um, your Pinterest as well as your, uh, your Instagram and Facebook all at the same time. You can do one pin and it goes to everything. So that's kind of a nice thing that, that a lot of these scheduling uh, programs offer. Um, so I, I tend to use those more than just sitting down and, and uh, you know, every, every day doing it just because I, my schedule is so flexible right now. And if I might just quickly add, right, if you look around, there are also a lot of tools out there that allow you to do, Victoria talked about the uh, sending it to Photoshop and getting uh, the wide screen. Like the, there are uh, applications, AI-based applications that allow you to do that as well. Uh, and perhaps at a lower cost, if cost is a key driver. And so one, one aspect of it that I encourage is to look out to see what are these tools out there which will make life, and I actually do this a lot with a lot of the, the companies I work with, is that most of these things can be automated. And once you get the process in place, it's literally a click of the button and spend five minutes of your uh, day kind of managing these things. And of course, then the engagement part. So there is a lot of technological solutions out there. It's just getting access to it and being aware of it. Uh, that is important. And, and I would add, if you know anybody who's young in their 20s and early 30s, they know it all. You know, I am, I am so humble that I will ask anybody for any help. And usually I can go to some of my, I, one of my, my associates here is in her mid 20s. And I mean, she is so computer savvy that it is, uh, it's just wonderful to, that, that whole generation has it. They get it, they understand it, and they can find things that I never knew existed. And I say, tap into your resources. If you've got kids, if you've got, I mean, Go to anybody you know, go to neighbors, go to people that help you out. I mean, all of us small business owners are looking for ways to cut costs. And I say, use the talent pool that's out there. They're, they want to share their wealth and we should be tapping into it. That's awesome. Thank you for the pitch, Victoria. <laughs> I didn't have to do that. That's awesome. And I agree, right? And the, there are these free resources, well, almost free resources where the students do want to do, the younger generation wants to have an experience, put it on their CVs and all of that stuff. And this is a great opportunity and they know this. I, they teach me most often about the tools that's out there. And I learn more about social media from them than I, I teach them. Uh, and it's a great way to kind of build off of the, what's already available in the community for free to advance your cause. Great. Well, so that leads us into the final question I have for both of you before we move into some reflection with attendees here today. Um, if you could leave uh, folks on the webinar with one piece of advice, what one sort of high level piece of advice would you give folks in this um, space as we're thinking about consumer and customer behaviors and trends? Mine would easily be meet your customers where they are. 
right now my customers are online. I kind of know how they shop and I'm, I'm doing everything I can to meet them where they are. Um, so get to know your customer base. Well, I, I'm a marketing professor, so I can't uh, argue with that, right? Meet the customers where you, uh, where you are, definitely. I will say one thing that I have in talk, working with a lot of these companies, people are seeing technology as uh, a as, uh, savior, right? And piggybacking on what Victoria said, like it's all technology is just a tool that enables you to connect with the customer. Know your customer, connect with the customer as intimately as possible. That's the secret to succeeding, right? It's, it's basic business 101, but don't fall for the fluff. Stay with, with the essence, which is know the customer, see where they're evolving, which means a lot of constant feedback. That's the only thing I got to say. Wonderful. Well, I um, want to say thank you to you both. Thank you for sharing your expertise and your time here this morning. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us here today. Um, so we have a few minutes left in the time, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen one last time, take us back to the um, slides. So one thing that we know um, is that it can be really hard as a business owner to set aside time for just thinking about some of these things. You're day to day, you're in the work of your business, and it sometimes can be challenging to set aside a few minutes to really think about those big picture trends. So what we're inviting everyone to do now um, is to use the worksheet that we've provided. Uh, we just dropped a link to it in the chat and I have it displayed on the screen here. And really take a couple of minutes before we wrap up today to think about what are some trends that are particularly relevant to your industry? What are the potential impacts that those trends might have for you? Um, there can be positive consequences or positive things that come from those trends. There can also be challenges or potential risks uh, that are associated with those trends as well. So this is really the time for you. We're going to take about five minutes to really think about some of those and how that applies to your industry and to your business and to use this time, set this time aside to really work on your business when you're usually so involved in working in your business. So I'm just going to pause for now. We'll take a few minutes and then we'll come back together to wrap up.
All right, we've reached our five minute mark. Please feel free to continue um, filling out this worksheet if you uh, if you would like. I'd like to thank uh, Gotham and Victoria one last time for their contributions today. We really appreciate you both. Um, and I'll turn it back over to Deandra. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Um, Alexandra, SBDC, this was a great session. Uh, really enjoyed it. I hope everyone got out of it uh, kind of what I did, um, just sitting and listening to everything. So um, <clears throat> we will send out an email with a link to the recording and evaluation and to the slides. Um, I put some things in the chat for you guys. Uh, and if you'd like to sign up for upcoming webinars or access recorded webinars, um, you can go to virginiasbdc.org slash training. We also have on our website, the COVID Business Recovery Center which we developed to help owners not only continue business operations, but to thrive and recover. The resources are designed to be used in collaboration with your local SBDC advisors, which of course, Alexandria is one of those. <clears throat> if you are not in the Alexandria area, you can email us help at virginiasbdc.org and we will get you connected with your local office. Um, or you can also access our website and you can sign up there as well. So thank you, everyone. We hope you enjoyed it, and we hope to see everyone at the next session. Thank you so much, Amy.